Hello, I'm Jefferson Hack, and on behalf of Nowness, it gives me great pleasure to be sitting here with Björk and Andrew Wang. Um, I've got goosebumps sitting here, um, knowing that we're going to be able to spend about 40 minutes together talking about uh, collaboration, about your new single that dropped today, The Gate, um, and the film that you guys worked on together, and many, many more things that you might have on the top of your mind that you just want to talk to us about today. So Bior, congratulations. Your single came out today, The Gate. How does it feel? Yeah, it's like a, definitely very thrilling. It's really, really cathartic and uh, yeah, it feels special. Very, yeah, different than before. It's so unexpected. When I listen to it today, it's so unexpected. Where's all the angst? Where's all the anger? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, You've come out all light and fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess the last album, yeah, for sure, was very much about grief and, uh, and sadness. And I guess when you grind the bottom <laughs> that um, uh, conscientiously, <laughs> you're going to like, eventually uh, float up to the surface and uh, become light and fluffy. And uh, <laughs> this song is a documentation of that probably. Mm. Well, Nakura was famously, you called it your heartbreak album and of course it dealt with you know your breakup from Matthew Barney and you know you exposed your vulnerability, you exposed your pain, you exposed your anger and all the different emotions that come with that process of like you like you said of, of grief in a way and um, you know this song opens up with the lyric my healing chest wound and um, it, in a way, it's very related to Volnacora because Volnacora also has that image that Andrew designed for the, L, for the LP cover with you when you're bent over, bent over double and you've got that bright red chest wound, that open wound from the, from the pain of, 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 the, of the breakup. So I guess it's, it's about love, this song, in a way. Uh, yeah, it's about almost like a metaphysical thing where the, 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 um, the wound of heartbreak, where, where you kind of feel um, you get, your heart gets broken and your chest kind of implodes. And when that sort of shape, oval shape, um, restores, it becomes a gate. And then you maybe discover even more so than before that, that it was there all, all along, you know? And that it's like a gate that when you are next to people you love, you exchange energy. And I felt really uh, lucky that and privileged that Andy was up for doing this video with, with us because we went really deep into, uh, Andy did with us a lot of videos for Vulnikura. And the wound was kind of like uh, going through that whole album and so to get, especially in the video of Two Family, uh, where I'm literally sewing. That's the VR film that you guys made together that's part of Bjork Digital. Yeah. Um, talk, so talk about that. No, and then we, I sew the wound together, so to come through that mm -hmm. with, with Andy and the sort of visual world, we were kind of, kind of almost gone into like short, uh, short speech <laughs> describing to that he would be the one who directed this video where actually it it heals and you and you uh, <laughs> maintain or you 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 get like healthy currents and energies uh, back where that you know and learn how to love in a healthy way again or something so Andrew, we, we won't see the film till Monday when it's premiered on nowness.com. There is a sneak preview of it happening in London for the public on the weekend on uh, Saturday and Sunday. So if the public come to the store, which is in uh, Surrey Street off the Strand in London, they'll be able to experience it as an installation. Um, tell me, what can we expect or what can the public expect when they come into the room to be confronted with your visual interpretation of this song? Um, again, I think this, like Bjork said, this, this film is kind of the full 
kind of caps off the full arc of everything we did for Volnikira, and this kind of takes off where Volnikira left off. Yeah. So they can, um, you know, I think, whereas um, Volnikira was very introspective, this one, you know, while it is a piece about love and two lovers, you know, that are the main characters in the piece, it's, um, it is kind of a very future-facing, um, still almost like sci-fi look <laughs> at, you know, what, um, what the future could be, you know, if, and I think, um, and it's also just extremely, um, you know, just visually packed. It's a, it's a really ambitious video that we set out to make. Um, it's full of incredible special effects, and it's yeah. set in this kind of cybernetic ecstasy is how I've sort of come to, look, come to describe it in my yeah. own way. Um, very futuristic. M m maybe your most CGI'd project that you've done together um, as a film. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first piece that Bjork and I did, Mutual Core, was also really effects heavy, but I think being a piece about the earth, quite literally, it made sense to use a lot of tactile puppetry and um, physical effects. But this one being, like you said, a cybernetic love story, um, it made sense to, to use um, fully CG techniques. And, um, you know, it was quite ambitious because we did um, a lot more data capture on set than we normally do. And we also just, um, to be honest, use a lot of the visual language that Alessandra Michel set out with the, mm -hmm. um, the dress that she's wearing. Um, you know, it was um, very much about... So you just dropped a really big name yeah. into the conversation, yeah. right? <laughs> Alessandro <laughs> Michele, who's the creative director of Gucci. Mm. So how did he get in between your creative process? How did that all come about? Björk, maybe, maybe talk about how you, how you and Alessandro, how, how Alessandro became a part of this um, project. Hmm. It's hard to actually pick the first moment. I think it was some sort of a uh, conversation, a visual <laughs> ping pong <laughs> between the sort of masks that uh, James Mary has been making. Uh, I'm wearing one of his beautiful masks right now. It's uh, so incredible, this collaboration with James, and I want to spend a little bit of time <laughs> talking about that because he's been making masks for you for for many years for about five years now i think right if not longer but but let's part that and come yeah. back to that let's talk about alessandro for a minute yeah i'm probably not going to remember exactly how it is but sort of in the feeling it is like he, uh, alessandro was adoring that somehow from afar mm. and it became somehow kind of a circle of some sort of inspiration or something and then uh, we, uh, uh, they approached me wanting to do something, and because I'm an old punk and I'm a bit <laughs> tricksy <laughs> when it comes to certain things like that, I was like, hmm, maybe not, but how about you, I, I, I'm not so good with, with these kind of huge corporate statements and don't like them so much, but one thing I, I do love is, being in a room with several fertile minds and yeah. just make things together. Like, like, let's knit something from scratch and let's just, like, do it together. So do you want to be part of, part of that conversation with us? And he was, like, right up for it. Well, what's so, so amazing is that, you know, fashion designers who have, you know, the, the most creative fashion designers that, that, have, that have been around have been a part of your story. I mean, you've really connected with fashion designers. So there was Hussein Jelain for Post, there was Alexander McQueen, famously for Homogenic and many other things, and more recently Iris van Herpen. And, uh, you know, many times you've worked with, with, um, with, with costume and design to create your character. And really in, the, this, in this film, the, the costume and the, the, the costume and the character almost won, aren't they? And, and, it, and it really, they're really at the center of everything. It's almost like a world with a universe within a universe. So I guess the contribution and the, and the dialogue between Ms. Alex, uh, Alessandra Michele and yourself must have been really, really uh, vibrant, very, like you say, very fertile ground to build such an incredible world from. I think for me, because this song for me is almost like a pure sphere that uh, me and, and Alejandro Arca, 
Parker. To bring another, another collaborator. To bring another yours. person into the picture. Uh, it's just, for me, it's like this perfect sphere. Mm. And, uh, and for me, the lyric really says it all. It literally spells it out if you read the lyric. And we had that between us. And uh, for me, it became very apparent that this is sort of a video where it kind of would be more about um, Andy's craft as, yeah. a, as a sort of post, I don't know what, what to call it, digital, what do you call it? Digital puppetry? filmmaker, yeah, or digital filmmaking. Yeah, and, and the dress, you know, would be almost like a character, you know, mm. but, but I think almost like, yeah, but it, like a like a sphere, you know, where where that would exist, and and the choreography of the the character. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's very really beautiful the, the way he does avatars. It's kind of like avatars. You know, it's mm. like puppetry, and he does it in a really. You can really tell it's Andy. Like nobody does it really like like yeah, Andy. What did what did Alessandro Michele bring bring to you, Andy? What did the, what did his contribution bring? Well. Um, Sort of bouncing off your question and also what Björk was saying, we, we ended Volnikira doing avatars for the VR experience and sort of telling Björk's story, her personal story, by proxy in this virtual world. And so when we, when we first spoke to Alessandro, he was looking at a lot of those avatars. So I feel like what he did is he made that character real and he, he, he made it in the most, you know, the grandest way possible with these, these iridescent materials. And, um, you know, Björk was also talking about when, when she first approached me about the film and the song, we talked about how it was, or Björk, it was Björk's idea to um, sort of uh, the, the basic narrative of this film being about two lovers passing a prism of love mm -hmm. back and forth to each other. And so when Alessandro kind of saw the, you know, w when I wrote the treatment, Alessandro read that and, you know, spoke to Björk and saw the work that we were doing on the Volnikura already and then he designed basically the avatar and the flesh, you know, for, for Björk to wear and, um, you know, that became the visual vocabulary for the film. Yeah. So, you know, while my job is to tell the story visually but also to look at what Alessandro's doing, pick out the, you know, actually look at the actual materials and replicate them digitally to extend them and that's, you know, that's very much what this film is about, is Björk extending herself, you know, through this gate and through the outfit she's wearing, and so, yeah. If I can add one thing, mm -hmm. I think out of all songs I've done and, and videos, it's been most kind of like a pure thread through. Like, I think me and Alejandro, Arca, Arca yeah. <laughs> were talking about prisms, and I was actually doing sketches in my diary, where like what what happens after this kind of wound and 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 you know when you have a shock you split into different colors almost like a like a prism and then the only thing that can heal you is love and then you unite them all into one point and Alejandro was reading all these books at the same time from a more uh, psychological point of view and then he sent me a song called Prism and we were talking about prisms as sound, yeah. as, a, as a sort of almost like synth synesthesia, like, like a, a, a prism. And then I wrote the lyric about like prism. <laughs> and then we did the video based on prism. And James made a mask that basically was a prism. And I think also Alessandro uh, uh, Michele. <laughs> was also inspired by James's prism masks. Yeah. And then James was inspired by the dress and we were all ended up being inspired by each other, but it was all kind of like coming from this one idea, like a prism. So it's both the sounds and the lyric and the uh, video and the masks and the dress. Yeah. Fantastic. And it, <laughs> let's, take a, let's take a look at that mask. So, is it, is it living? Is it moving? <laughs> I hope so. It's and truly alive, but it brings you alive as well in a very different way. It, mar it hides your face, but it also brings you alive in a very different way. How do you feel when you're wearing the mask? Do you feel each mask brings a different aspect of you out, or do you feel it's, it's about mixing a mask to a moment and an outfit? <laughs> 
think it's different. Because they're very, they're very sensual, the masks that James has been making for you, which is very different from the idea of a mask, which is to obscure. They bring a, they bring a real sensuality to your face and to your character. I think our, our work together, mine and James, is very, it's very intuitive. So sometimes we don't even speak much, but I think sometimes they come from my idea. Sometimes he, like this one, he just did comes from it's like, him. It's almost like the, the, your eyes are extending <laughs> above your head and your, your lips are extending through the, through the, through the leaves and the, it's really... Yeah, I mean, I think it's both hiding and revealing. I mean, I think maybe because I've been doing what I do for such a long time, it, it, uh, it helps me kind of be more expressive in the ways I know I can be generous to people that I don't know and then I can be more generous and uh, protective and give certain things to my closed ones so in a strange way it's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, helps me um, kind of make that flow he more healthy if that makes any sense I know you a little bit. We have a we have a we have a, a personal relationship as well as a professional one. And I know that you also will wear fantastic outfits and masks just to have lunch with your friends on a Saturday afternoon, where you know when you're not working, <laughs> when you're not promoting a record, there is no kind of you're not you're not you know it. This isn't just for this isn't just an act. You really live your world fully and you are in a world that you create fully all the time when you're making music when you're when you're in the periods between making music it's 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 just something i wanted to um to ask you about because there people might get the impression that there is a Bjork character that you've invented and then there's you who sits at home with like you know sweatpants and a t-shirt and i don't know you know hangs out without any of the artifice, but you really are not like that. Hmm. I don't know. I, I think I'm a bit of both. I just came from a month of mixing, where I was actually in Mixing the, the album, so finishing the album. Yeah, where I actually was in the studio for every day for like six weeks or something. Or Did you not have your mixing mask on? Mm -mm. We took, you were naked. Comfy you were naked. I was naked. <laughs> naked mixing. That's it. It's when it gets all bare. Yeah, actually, it was like in a coma and remote control through Andy's avatars, the mixing desk. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about your relationship with Alice, Alejandra Arca. Yeah. All right. Now, the sound of this record, I haven't heard, I've heard a little bit, a, a few tracks from it, not all of it, but it's very different from Volnacora. It's, a, it's, a, it's consciously different. Um, talk about some of the differences that we can expect in the sonic envelope of the album and then in some of the stories that you've, that in, in some of the songs. Yeah, I think uh, I did, I had written Mulnukura and done the string arrangements for like 14 months. Uh, most of the writing when I met Alejandro and he did the beats to it kind of after it was sort of done, except Not Get, which was yeah. a song where it was the first song where we kind of wrote together and produced together uh, because at that point we were our relationship musical partnership was so strong and then when we were done and it was so dramatic like doing all those concerts in Carnegie Hall and everybody were crying and you know so we were like we've earned the lightness you know right <laughs> and so I also felt as a musician um, I obviously saw a gigantic musician in him mm -hmm. and I felt that he had gone into my world in, with such elegance and dignity and, and interpreted it, helped me what was there that I wanted to meet like let's meet on a more equal basis and of course um, it's my album for sure I mean and, and he makes his albums and they have his name on it but as just as a pure musician we kind of we decided to enter this other world and this other island, which is the sort of 
Arka Björk overlap. And he pulled out like B-sides from my past that the more sort of instrumental music mm -hmm. that I made, a song called Patapis and uh, Amber Gris March, which was a song from TR9. And, and other like really strange B-sides that he had kind of liked when he was a child in Venezuela. And we kind of pulled these kind of, took those coordinates and made this kind of new picture. And then I arranged flute, started a 12 piece flute, Icelandic flute section, and spent a few months recording and rehearsing with them. And so I'm kind of taking the flute, the instrument I learned as a kid, uh, and, and kind of like tapping, putting that into everything. Mm. So the whole album is a little bit about air because it's sort of, we decided to have synths that have a lot of air sounds yeah. in them and, and flutes that sound synthy. So it's that sort of crossover there. And, uh, and also we realized there are certain chord progressions that we sort of share, even though we are generations apart. And there's a certain kind of joy, like where we keep our joy is kind of similar and where we keep our sort of darkness is not that dissimilar. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm really pleased with it. Um, I just started finishing mixing it yesterday, but... And how I, does that feel? You said earlier before the interview started, you said you were a bit fried. Is oh that my how God. it feels? You, do, you know, I, I mean, like my brain is like, I was, it's like if, if you would just edit it up, like a film, like, I mean, but Andy comes from the same thing. He's been like doing posts for eons. Your, your, your brain just becomes like a cabinet with like hundred little, little drawers. And, and I was like started getting scared of myself where I knew, I knew I heard a sound and it was like, no, there's too much reverb in song seven on, you know, and I know, I knew, mm. and I was like talking, I know that's on the third minute and 12 seconds, that particular sound. Like it was just like, it's just scary. You don't want to go there, you know. Um, you must be really relieved that it's over, ha how very happy to be able to release it to the world. Um, when you did the interview for Days that came out um, last month, um, you called it your dating album, your Tinder album. <laughs> so tell us about some of the stories, some of the, some of the songs that we can expect to hear. Why is it your dating album? Why did you describe it like that? I was just looking at the video just thinking, it's the ultimate Tinder ad. Yeah, Tinder totally. ad. It is. Not, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, mm. <laughs> Exactly. 69. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I like to leave it there. I mean, it is, it sort of needs to be mysterious. Of course. I mean, we, I mean one thing maybe we could say that we kind of, didn't we talk about that Chinese goddess a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that was a song is ultimately about openness. And that's kind of what you are when you're dating, when you're open, you're like suddenly reopening yeah. and like the world is vibrant to you again. And, um, it's that energy and optimism of that openness. It's yeah. optimism, yeah. And we were, um, well, Bjork and I were talking about, and James were talking about, like, Chinese, the Chinese goddess Guan Yin. She's kind of like the goddess of, self, of salvation. And, um, you know, she just has this very vertical, all the statues of her are just very vertical, and she has this very vertical crest. And so I thought it really worked beautifully with James's mask, the way it's like this kundalini kind of, weaving that, that kind of culminates here, um, I thought it was like a, um, a really beautiful motif to, to have that verticality. Um, it's like openness, but also this like assertion mm -hmm. of hope. And, and that's why I, I find the video very optimistic. As the director working with kind of four different creative, creative directors who are all inputting, James Mary, you know, mm -hmm. Alejandro McKayley, Björk, how, how does how do you take on board all of those different inputs? I mean, is it is it something that becomes confusing, or is it something that becomes liberating in a way? I find it a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the most fun thing for me to sit with Bjork and James and just riff and share YouTube videos. And you know, James um, is such an amazing mind, and you know, has such a wealth of knowledge, and he'll you know make an entire. Um, you know, document for us to look at about, you know, the, the history of Kundalini lines or something, you know, like, so I think for me, it's, I find it inspiring and enriching and nourishing 
um, you know, sometimes you work with artists and, um, you know, they'll, they'll give you a blank slate to make, make a music video. And that's nice too, but I find, you know, just as a creator, it's always nice to have a launch pad and um, to, to actually just have something that you can almost like academically explore together um, in, in, in real depth and then turn that off and just start making mm -hmm. and see what comes out of that. So I find it really nourishing. And Bjork, you really kind of create an environment for collaboration to thrive. I mean, ever since the beginning of your, you know, the uh, early beginnings of your career, you've always been in collaborative situations, making music with other artists. Um, you know, even in even even in the Sugar Cubes, it was very much a kind of co commune spirit. I would say, a sort of a punk DIY commune spirit, with everyone sharing and being involved in all aspects of the music and artwork and things like that. And then right through, working through your career, working with so many different um, collaborators, visual ones and, um, and sonic ones. In a way, you're the master of collaboration and somebody that <laughs> I really look up to as, as setting a template for, um, for being, remaining relevant and remaining current through, through collaboration. What's the key to successful collaboration? <laughs> Thank you. I'm like blushing. You can see it here. Uh, I don't know. I mean, is it as simple as something like just openness and 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 willingness, or is there more to it? I'm just a very impulsive kind of person. Uh, I really act on hunches, you know. I think, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's really hard for me. To, uh, also, because every relationship is different. I would also feel like, like for example, my relationship with Andy Huang is very different to my relationship to James Mary, you know, and my relationship to Alejandro, Arca. That's very different. So it's a bit, I don't want to say it, it's all the same, but... Um, um, it seems like you really thrive on being in dialogue and exchange with other people and that it's those relationships that keep you moving forward and you choose very carefully and sometimes you go on mad hunches I can you know I can I, I've seen in the past but what that does it's about it's about interaction and about not being feared of what the outcome might be yeah, maybe it is because uh, I don't want to <laughs> go too deeply into it but when I was 14, I, I, I met all these people that were older than me, and it was the punk scene in Iceland. And like you say, it was a very sort of a group. It wasn't about dropping the egos. And if somebody needs to make a poster for this poetry book, we all do it together. And I come from this kind of background, but I think I did that for 10 years. So when I moved to London and met you guys, um, I had that muscle very well developed, mm. but I also I actually spend a lot of my time on my own, arranging music, walking outside, making the melodies. So that's like a separate side to me that I don't really talk about. Mm -hmm. So the solitaire or the sort of lonely hours in front of the computer, I'm just joking. I'm sure you know very well. Yeah. <laughs> and that sort of craft, uh, you have that, you know. I think mm -hmm. maybe if I'm going to pretend that I know something, which I don't. <laughs> I, I would maybe say uh, you, can, you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Maybe they can coexist. Mm -hmm. And that chamber of you, yourself that writes the scripts or writes the poetry or walks alone outside and writes melodies or writes that novel, <laughs> you know, that sort of solitaire side of you, you can feed that. And then you can go and be very collaborative. Yeah. And then if it works really well to be collaborative I and mean, you drop your ego and you are very sort of, you heal and you make a flow and, you, and it's something one plus one is three, you know, it's more than you would have done on your own. Then you can go back in the other space, you know. So I, I think you don't have to choose if I had to say anything. You can, you can do both. Yeah. That's brilliant. So, yeah, that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. You've collaborated, you've collaborated on at least five or, or six, this will be your sixth project together. Um, tell me about your first coming together around Mutual Core. <laughs> How did that come about? How did you meet? Um, I made a film 
that was like a personal project that involved a lot of kind of similar, it was like on a similar wavelength to what Bjork had already um, developed with uh, Mutual Core, like the, the app and, and Biophilia. And so um, I believe it was Mark Bell actually that shared and the, the work with you and then um, Bjork reached out. Coincidentally, I was actually in Iceland when, but you, when you were in Buenos Aires when I first heard about or heard from you. And so um, I flew home, flew right back, and then we just started, you know, it was kind of just a brand new mm -hmm. collaboration and, and Bjork was, again, very generous and open and kind of allowed me to, to run with it. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, and you know, that, that was my first experience with, um, you know, frankly, just feeling that generosity from, from Bjork as a collaborator. And you're in a really unusual place as a, as a director of music videos and commercials because your work is also an art institution. So, you know, having Black Lake in MoMA as a, as a centerpiece and now in the permanent collection there must be very interesting to be able to sort of transcend audiences and transcend the boundaries of what a music video is and what an art installation is. Um, yeah. And I remember experiencing it and going in, and it was the two. It was two screens, a two-screen installation. Um, tell us why you were why you were interested in exploring those kind of dimensions with two screens, and then, furthermore, what the virtual reality experience yeah. kind of allowed you as a filmmaker to. I guess how that allowed you to have a different dialogue with the audience for both yeah. you and Bjork. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I have to credit Bjork for her original instincts when we first met to talk about the MoMA project, um, Bjork's head was already in the thinking in the 360 space or in an immersive, in an immersive space. And when we talked about the, you know, with Klaus Biesenbach at the museum, we knew that we wanted to create uh, something that people can share together, something that's immersive. Um, but, you know, I think it was, it was, I mean, to be honest, I think me and Bjork have been through a lot of just trial and, an er and error, you know, like we've yeah. been through a lot of experimenting. I mean, there's that problem of, of wanting something to be immersive but shareable. And so I think Black Lake and Stone Milker kind of go hand in hand. Black Lake was kind of the attempt to try and, and you know, create that, that installation physically. Um, and, you know, I think with the... the um, just being, you know, a museum right in the middle of Manhattan, there, there we had certain challenges, and I, I think what we found with Stone Milker is that you that you can create that immersive experience, but it is an intimate one. It is like a one-on-one -on -one, one, and uh, you know, experience. And I think that's what um, was so exciting about VR when we went on that road together. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm really, um, I feel good about Black Lake that we shot it the way we did. It was the death Absolutely. song. It <laughs> should have been here. Mm -hmm. You know, it should have been cinematic. It should have been widescreen and it should have been, the, the song was a very li linear scrolling song and so we needed the format to reflect the song. Whereas yeah. Stone Milker was this um, yeah. fugue-like circular song and so it made sense to shoot in a circular medium. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, through that experience, I've just frankly learned a lot with Bjork on on just how to make the medium speak to the content of the of the the song and the you know. So yeah. it's been a learning experience. Uh, he's being so flattering, so I, I get to have a go too. I think because obviously for every musician, when they make music, it's a very spatial thing. Mm. It's a very sonic thing. You know, okay, this song is yellow and light and floats in the sky and another like k-pop song or whatever is you know like it's always spatial so to, to collaborate with somebody like Andy you can come up with this kind of really abstract spatial ideas mm. and you know he's gonna execute them really really well so you you get braver with 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 suggestions and I think also just with follow it was actually really exciting to just just jump into this deep end of let's just do the VR thing and let's yeah. experiment in the open, you know, like... But you've gone beyond experimenting in VR, you've gone fully into VR. I mean, you've done, you've created Bjork Digital, which is now a, a VR touring show, which has just opened in Moscow, I think, this week. 
mm -hmm. um, and has been to like eight different countries. Um, you've kind of taken, you've kind of gone all in on VR. Why, why did you believe in it so much so early? What was it about VR that you just thought, I've got to take this to, I've just got to spend all my time exploring this? I mean, every month I'll probably answer this question differently, but right now <laughs> I'll try a new answer to see what it feels like. Okay. But I think something about the heartbreak saga of Vulnakura, and there were certain decisions, like, like I was just thinking, oh my God, I didn't perform any of those songs in TV. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, no, like that's not where it's going to go. And I think I was really protective of the sensitive material that it would be very easily be sensationalized sensationalized mm -hmm. and i didn't want it to be like a soap opera you know i wanted just to be very uh, wrapped in a careful ribbon you know mm -hmm. a bow and and kept in a really precious place so i i, I did very very few things but very very select uh, like few carnegie halls albert hall and then uh, how I took that album to the world. But mm. then, and, and the MoMA show was, worked in some ways, but then there were other ways where, where it maybe didn't work. So we learned a lot from that. And when we did the Stonemaker VR, we literally had an idea in the evening, shot it the next day, and it was, you know, it was so effortless after like and it's so a moving. year and a half yeah. of just 50 billion meetings to try to get this kind of to work in the museum context so we were certainly like wow there's like this this we tried to make it work in this context it didn't and it has just too much concrete on top like skyscrapers sitting on top of us but here we can go forever in this direction and it and we just we were just lucky enough to figure it out that that's where it could grow and I, obviously as a musician and as a performer I knew, compared to all my other albums, that Vulnukura had the theatrical potential for, a, you know, a Greek tragedy or like, you know, like a really like, mm. you know, like Shakespearean sort of situation, you know. Uh, and the, the VR was perfect for that, but it was private. There was yeah. something about just putting that thing on your head and the headphones, and it's not there, your, your, your private life isn't, just spread all over the universe. It's, it's like one-on-one, -on -one and it's more like, it's not in some gossip columns or something. Do you know what I mean? It's like a private circus or private theater. And it just suited the music, I think, it, it, that it was like reading a book. You know, yeah. it's, 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 you, it's like one-on-one -on -one album. And I think that's one of the reasons why it sort of worked. Okay. But we totally, believe me when I say this, we found out by trial and error. There was a lot yeah. of walls yeah. we hit until we got to that point, you know, both emotionally, or not emotionally, but just like musically, and but also just with technology, because mm. all the VR videos are done with different technologies, different teams, different softwares, different, like we could t do another interview just about that. Yeah. So there was, and that's where I have to uh, cheer Andy because I, I'm not so knowledgeable about all that, but just to make it like, like figure out how that would work, but also give room for the emotional or the music, you know? Mm. So that felt right for the emotion of Nakora. Does that mean there won't be VR projects from this new album and that you're going to release it, it in a different way and that you're maybe going to perform in a different way. Like, what can we expect? What's, what's, what can we expect from the presentation of this album? I felt that this album, that's why we wanted to do a, a normal video <laughs> on YouTube. We're back. <laughs> Not on YouTube, on Nowness. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. It's a very so but I know I'm what, sorry. But I know what you mean. You wanted to do a video that could be shared and could be distributed and could be seen on a, on, on a screen and not have to be put into a VR headset. Yeah, Is that what you mean? maybe also emotionally because it's sort of, you know, we're tapping into the Chinese goddess of love and it's sort of about like the, the most open uh, emotional position you can be in, similar 
I mean... Well, it's your dating album, so I guess you want to <laughs> wanna get out and be as available to as many people as possible. Like, keep your options open. <laughs> You know, when you're in heartbreak, you need a small, close circle of friends around you. Now, the sky's the limit, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I think I'm like blushing, of course, but I, I think you're be just... doing free gigs in like Hyde Park. Next. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think emotion. I think it's very important to trust that with technology, you have all the different formats, and they actually match emotional stances. Sure. And I think uh, nowness video or, or like a 2D online video, it, it is very sort of like extrovert as of all formats, it's probably the most extrovert one. And of all my songs, this one is probably the, the message of this lyric is, is kind of like all is full of love too, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like as open as possible. So that's sort of the reason, but about the future, uh, I don't want to say too much because it might jinx, jinx it, but um, there are several ideas going on and I, I think I will find some interesting ways of, uh, I will solve the riddle of how to perform this album live. I think well, whatever you do, yeah. you know that it's going to be new and different and extraordinary. But talking about extrovert, last time I saw you, you were DJing in a club in Paris <laughs> for the after party of Iris van Herpen. And you are quite an extrovert DJ, I have to say. You do, <laughs> you do give it some on the decks. Um, <laughs> I wish we had some decks here. We could do a little demo of Björk DJing. It would be fierce. But why, you love it, right? You love DJing. What is it about DJing that gets you so extra, it gets you so amped. I think it may be being brought up in a small town. Like, when I was a teenager, if you wanted a good night out, <laughs> you basically just had to go to the bar with least people and just take over. <laughs> that's, that was, that's basically my method. So, I mean, you've been with us in Reykjavik, you know, you, you just go to a tiny bar and... Reykjavik never sleeps. And then you just take turns in teaching, and yeah. if the music is bad, you know, you just have to stand up and do it yourself. <laughs> but I mean, I'm not the only one, who, Icelandic person who's like that. I mean, so I mean, I've more or less been teaching since I was as a teenager, yeah. just like that. But I think last, especially with uh, Branton Stosi, we had a little team in, in New York where we started teaching with like themes. Like for example, we once DJed for five hours, just bass lines, which was both Amazing. from cellos, you know, like Bach, to like Acid House, to like, you name it, also with young composers. Um, and then it was a lot of people that we did it together. And what then were we, some of the other themes? I love that, just bass lines. What, what other it themes? It was so, you like your ears after that, it was like, we started like at four, because we were like anti, just DJing in like drunk in a party, we want to have like wide open ears mm. Mm. and then we would start like, yeah, like, yeah, it would be like Bach's cellos and then, but it was so fun because it was so many of us. And then the next thing we did was hand claps. So it's, wow. that was so fun. And we started in like those kind of Moroccan mm -hmm. um, uh, music, um, spiritual. And then we went to like, um, girl groups and hip-hop, R&B, and everybody had like bleeding palms <laughs> at the end of the night because it was like, my girlfriend's back. <laughs> and, and we basically just, we start really sober and cappuccinos and really serious and play like Steve Reich or something. And then five hours into it, we're pouring drinks into our ears and, you know, clapping our hands. So. Um. <laughs> Clubs are so important, though. They, you know, you were talking about Reykjavik and going out as a as a teenager and taking over the music, but like when you, you you're still, I still see you and hear about you going to some of the most cutting edge clubs in London, and I'm sure you you love to go and explore new music and what's happening on an underground on the underground level in Berlin or in or in New York or in the places where you're touring. Um, what is it about clubs and the music in clubs that's so important for you? And are clubs still good? I mean, everyone always says, oh, it was better 
back in a certain day, you know, whatever that day might be. But you seem to be very much plugged into what's happening now, so... Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I don't know, I've just always kind of followed... I mean, it's just about waking up in the morning and... Or not waking finding up that, in the morning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> finding that song that's going to like make your day, you know. Yeah. It, it's that sort of enthusiasm, but... I mean, I don't go out that often, but when I, I when there's I really follow what's going on, and then when I go out, I make sure it's something really special. So I've been really lucky, you know. Last few years in Brooklyn, there's been a lot of stuff going on, a lot of really amazing music, and uh, and when I'm in London, I, I I've been I'm, I also obviously got uh, really good. I, I, been doing those kind of combined DJ nights with strange themes in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and then three years ago I did a few here in London with a few friends, Andy from Platt and Matthew Herbert yeah. and and Hacks and Cloak and Arca and and uh, Mika from uh, Mika Levy. And Basically, you and your friends are a touring DJ lineup <laughs> that are festival worthy. So wherever you go, there's going to be a party, I guess. Oh, I don't know. You like, um, yeah. And um, Bjork Digital, where can we expect it to to be going next? Um, well, it's in four places close to Russia and and Europe <laughs> in the autumn, uh, and then. It will go travel next year to South America, probably. And it's really sweet because now we're adding the gate. And I'm, I'm hoping it can be this thing that travels and I can add whatever I'm doing Great. into it. Oh, that's so fantastic. But that's obviously it's, it's, um, it's about, you know, how many people offer us or request, you know, you know, request us. Which countries want re request to have it? Um, um, well, that's brilliant. Um, I was going to uh, ask you, what's the name of the album? <laughs> Has it, oh have, you, have you decided yet, or will, can, you, can you reveal it here for the first time? I had thousands... I want a world exclusive, come on. Okay. <laughs> I have had thousand name suggestions, and I think it's going to be called Utopia. I can't think of anything better. Is that official? Well, if I change my mind five minutes before the album cover goes into print, that might happen. Okay. But as I'm here with you guys, I kind of oh. like the fact that it's a cliche, that word, and I like the fact that it has like a fascistic, weird, like, I want the world to be like this mm. feeling about it, because that sort of it's a proposal how we can live in the future with nature and technology in the most optimistic way possible. You know, and, and you know, the, we have Trump, we have Brexit, we have our issues in Iceland, we have our environmental issues. I think if there ever was an urgency or necessity to come up with a, another utopian model, how we're going to live our lives, I think it's now. And this is my proposals. Or mine and Alejandro's, because it's very, um, we wrote it very much together. Well, it's been a real privilege talking to you, Björk, and it's been <laughs> a real honour to talk to you too, Andrew. Um, you've told us so much about your process, about collaboration, um, about this new film that we're going to see on Nowness on Monday, about your new album, and you've revealed the title of it here, <laughs> Utopia. <laughs> Smoke coming out of the <laughs> font. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and thanks so much for everybody um, who's joined us on Facebook for this Facebook Live. Um, it's been really, really fun doing this, and um, hopefully it won't be the last time we all get to talk to each other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.